for having me. I think this is great. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be part of this and to just tell you all a little bit about some of the things that we work on. Um, so ultimately what the goal of the imaging platform is, is to extract information from biological images. And I started off as a microscopist. My initial training is in biology, not computer science. Um, and I just fell in love. I figured if I was going to be looking at data all day, at least it ought to be pretty data. Um, but it turns out that in addition to just being pretty, biological images actually convey a tremendous amount of information in a way that a lot of other biological techniques still can offer one or two advantages of, but perhaps not the whole package. Um, we can see information about individual molecules and not just how much of them there is, but where they are. What are they doing? Are they interacting with other molecules? And we can see this on a cell by cell basis. So we can get really detailed information about the heterogeneity that's going on in an individual biological case. So that's the position where we're starting from is that we have these images and they can teach us something about biology. But people still don't really think about microscopy images as quantitative data. And it's because for a lot of their history, they weren't. Um, these are some beautiful drawings from Ramoni Cajal. Um, there's been some traveling exhibitions over the years, and if you ever get a chance to go, I absolutely recommend it. His drawings are beautiful and fascinating and incredibly close to what he could actually see under the microscope and what we can see in our own microscopes today. But in those days, being a good scientist meant drawing what you saw and maybe trying to do something where you projected it on a wall and traced it. But otherwise, you were just drawing what you saw. And the quality of your artistry determined the quality to which you were conveying things accurately. Uh, this would not have been a good era for me personally to be doing science. Uh, but thankfully, someone came along and invented the digital camera. So now when we talk about microscopy images, and I'm talking about images of cells, we're just talking about numbers. We're talking about arrays of numbers. Um, and that's true whether or not we're talking about a little sort of toy example, like this image of a dot here, or the digital camera that's in your, that's in your phone, that's on your computer. All of these things are just numbers uh, that we arrange in a certain way, and they convey to our brains something about the world around us. Um, but since these are numbers, we can treat them as numbers and we can treat them statistically. And we can do things to actually try and extract quantitative information in a way that we really couldn't before. But still a lot of scientists will say, well, yeah, but I can see the thing that I care about in my, in my images. And so I don't really need to do that. Um, why would I need to quantitate something I can see? The whole point of this is to be able to see what's going on in our samples. And the problem with that is that human brains are just not very quantitative. Um, so when I first put this picture up, or perhaps still, if you're looking at this on a pretty small screen, uh, this looks like a color image. This is not a color image. This is a gray image with some colored lines drawn on top, and your brain is filling in the rest. Our brains are designed to take a look at a situation and give us information quickly. They're not designed to give us information accurately. They're just trying to give us the idea of what's going on. So if there's a threat in our environment, we can respond to it. So even when we think that there's something we can see in a biological image, we might not actually be seeing it. We, our brains might be giving us incorrect information. And so that's where we start on this journey of trying to come up with tools that allow you to extract quantitative, accurate biological information from pictures from microscopes. And so I'm gonna talk in this talk about two different ways of thinking about images. And the first is, I know what I wanna see and I'm gonna go look for it. And that's the way that most people think about doing image analysis, and at least in my field. Um, and in the second half, I'm gonna talk about some ways of looking at images that are a little bit more exploratory, but it helps to have the basis first of what happens when you know what you wanna find. So the tool that we typically use to do this is a tool called Cell Profiler. Uh, the first version of it came out almost 20 years ago um, and was developed by Ann Carpenter and Ray Jones. Um, there have been a tremendous number of people who've worked on this tool over the years. Um, and what I think has made it really special is we've always had a mixture of people working on it. So the folks who are highlighted in green, including myself, all come from a biology background. We were biologists first and computer scientists second. 
the people who are highlighted in blue are professional software engineers or professional computer scientists. And so we've always had those two groups working really closely together in tandem, which has allowed us to make some pretty powerful tools where we have best practices of software engineering, the tools work well, but also things are phrased in a way that you don't need to be a computer scientist to understand. Um, so profiler doesn't have to be used for biology. We've seen it used in things like material science research as well, or lots of other places where you just might want to understand what's happening in a picture. Um, but it's primarily used by biologists. And so we, we've written most of the documentation and things in a very biology focused way. I'm not really going to talk about cell profiler analysts at all, uh, but cell profiler and cell profiler analysts essentially form two halves of what's needed to do in order to understand an image. With cell profiler, you take an image and you turn it essentially into a series of measurements. You pull out things about the objects that you care about in the image or about the image as a whole if you don't want any information about particular objects. But most scientists' goal isn't just to have a big pile of spreadsheets. We want to actually have the answer to a question. And so that's where cell profiler analyst comes in, which allows you to do image-centric data exploration. So take a look at, you know, oh, there's a data point with an interesting, really far from the norm uh, value. What does the image look like? Is it actually the image that shows something biologically interesting, or is it a piece of crud that fell on top of my cells? We sometimes think about these tools as measure everything and ask questions later. And hopefully by the end of this talk, especially in the second half of this talk, I'll explain to you why measure everything is really a big mantra of ours. So this is what cell profiler looks like. Um, one thing I should have mentioned was written on one of my previous slides, but this is free and open source. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, it's really important to us that anybody who wants to be able to use this to do good science can use it to do good science. Um, cell profiler is ultimately at its heart an image analysis workflow tool. So we have something that we call the pipeline panel. And what the pipeline panel does is it allows you to put individual image analysis steps, which we call modules, together in any combination in any order that you want. Um, then however many images you have, whether that's three or three million, you can put through the same series of steps. And the pipeline itself forms an ability to do reproducible science. The pipeline file is just a text file. You can send it to your coworker. If you wanna have your coworker be able to do the same analysis that you do, you can attach it to a paper and say, hey, this is how I did my analysis and anybody in the world can verify that that's how your analysis was done. It really enables you to know exactly where your data came from. Each of the modules, which we're up to about 90, I think, uh, has then a settings panel where you can configure the settings that belong. Put your images. So this one is very basic and doesn't have a ton of configurable settings, but I'll show you one later that has a lot of configurable settings. The most important button in cell profiler is right here. This is the help button. Um, 90, it turns out, is a really large number of modules and a really large number of things to remember that Cell Profiler does. With the settings, where I think the last time I counted, something like 950 settings in Cell Profiler. And that's a tremendous amount of things to try and remember. And so we want you to always be able to go to something to try to understand what a particular module or what a particular setting is doing. So every one of these 90 modules and every one of these 950 settings has a question mark button next to it that explains what it's doing, often can give you some tips about how to set individual modules so that you have some idea of exactly how to configure this, even if you're not an expert in computer science. There are two different ways you can interact with the program. Um, the one that most people spend most of their sort of face time with sub profiler is called test mode, where you can go through one at a time and actually interact with individual images and sort of see if I tweak in a setting, how it changes the output of my analysis. And you'll spend a bunch of time doing that. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can click output settings to set where you want the output of your analysis to go, and then hit this analyze button. And Cell Profiler will natively multi-thread, and it will run however many images you have. Again, we've used it for experiments with three images, and we've used it for experiments with three million. Uh, 
we have a lot of different kinds of things that can happen in Cell Profiler, uh, things like file processing, measurement. I'm going to talk through the specifics of a lot of these categories and why they might be valuable as we go on. But I want to point out some of the things that also we have stuff for 3D analysis. Uh, we even have some special things for people who research C. elegans nematode worms. Um, but we, again, here want to try and make the large number of things we have available useful and searchable. And so you can search modules for keywords. So if, say, I want, I know that the thing I want to know is the size of my cells. Um, I can search size here, and I will find out that there's a module called Measure Object Size and Shape, which would allow me to measure the size of my cells. If I had searched area, I'm not going to get that module to come up, but it will, if there's no module with that name, search the help of all of the modules. And so I would have found in the help for the measure object size and shape module that, that it measures area, and I could have found it that way. When you open up an image in Cell Profiler, it looks like this. So what we're looking here is actually um, cells that have been extracted from a fruit fly. And what we're looking at is their nuclei that are being stained with a dye that binds to the nucleus. Um, I can, if I want, zoom in. And so all of these little circles that you can see are individual cell nuclei. And I can zoom in. I can see if I hover over a particular pixel, my X, Y position, as well as the intensity. So if I want to say whether or not a threshold is being calculated correctly, for example, I can hover my cursor over places where I think the image is dark and there are no nuclei present and places that I think are bright and I think there are nuclei present and I can get a sense of what the threshold ought to be. Um, I can also do things like measure the size by clicking and dragging across a nucleus. I can figure out how big it is. So if I want to, for example, set a cutoff and say, you know, that something like this little dot here is too small. I don't care about it. It's not a real nucleus but the real nuclei I care about are about this big, I can figure out how big that big is so that I can set a reasonable size cutoff of which objects to keep. So Cell Profiler uses what's called conventional computer vision um, in order to find objects. And essentially all that means is algorithms that have been developed about how computers can learn to see images over the last 50 or so years maybe even a little bit further back than that. But all classical image and all small classical computer vision works off of the principle that my image is bright in the cases, in the places where I want my objects to be and everywhere else is dark. You can see that that's true here in this image of fruit fly cells. We have the things we don't care about is this background that's dark and the things we do care about are these bright circles. Not all images look like this though. Like that may not be true. For segmentation purposes, and when I talk about segmentation, I talk about finding where the objects are and saying, this is object one, this is object two, this is object three. Because not all images start out looking like that, anything you can, you can do to make your image look like that is legal. You're allowed to do it. Um, but you have to be really careful because you don't want to measure images that you've manipulated in some way. You always want to report an unmanipulated measurement. So you can do this to find objects, but not to measure them later. Um, you might need to enhance dim signal that really is there, but it's just really hard to see. Or you might need to mask out bright objects. Dead cells are often, for example, much brighter than live cells. And so I don't care about the dead cells. I don't want to know that they're there, but they might be brighter than my real live cells. And so I need to find a way to get rid of them. The more transformations that you do in order to make it true that only the things you care about are bright and everything else is dark, you want to make sure to check the segmentations you've created against your raw images. And we offer a few different ways in Cell Profiler to do this. And so here's some example of some human cells that have been segmented. Um, we can see their nuclei on the left here and with the blue circles um, and sort of this magenta um, on the right. And then also we have a dye that stains actin, which is a big component of the cell cytoskeleton or literally the cell skeleton. And so we, by overlaying the objects that we found on top of the image, we can see that in general, we did a pretty good job. I'm not really sure if this super bright thing actually should have been called or not, 
but it's not so much brighter than what's around it that I definitely, definitely want to exclude it. So I'm not going to read all of these to you, but there are a lot of things you can do in order to do that transformation of getting things bright and everything else dark. Uh, one that I do want to point out is a module called Run ImageJ Macro. So ImageJ is by far the most popular tool in this space, and it's because it's a great tool. It's still the first tool I reach for whenever I have a brand new image set, but it's really exploratory. Um, so for self, you may want to use self-profiler when you have a lot of images you're looking at, but ImageJ has a lot more functionality. And so if you are comfortable writing just a little tiny bit of code, self-profiler is mostly designed to make it so you don't have to write code. But if you're comfortable writing a very small amount of it, you can access any functionality that's in ImageJ and self-profiler will just call out to your local copy and run things there too. So you can get the benefits of two softwares in one. So once you have the images loaded and pre-processed, you then need to actually find the objects and not just where are they, but what are their boundaries? So here, I would say that this is probably two objects. We have one cell here that is this circle and one cell here that is this circle, or these are nuclei, actually not cells, but they're, they're very close together. They're basically touching. So step one, is always in classical computer vision, distinguishing the foreground from the background, what you would call thresholding. So essentially, where is my stuff and where is my not stuff? And then actually splitting and merging objects properly. Um, this isn't, you know, it's only a two-step process. It's not the end of the world to try and learn how to do it. Um, and we try in self to start by tuning most of the parameters with sort of reasonable defaults so that you don't actually need to know what all of the configuration options are. We have this advanced setting set to no. But in practice, if you want to do this well, and if you want to do this for objects that aren't just, say, perfect little spheres, there are a lot of configurable parameters. Um, and I'm going to talk about why this isn't ideal in just a minute. But and I'm not going to go through what each of these does, because that's not the point of this talk. But there's a lot of things you need to understand in order to do this at an expert level. Once you have done it though, Cell Profiler offers you a lot of ways that you can then do things with your objects, like you can filter them. So say for example, I only care about the cells that have green dye inside them. I can filter out to only the ones that are green. Or say I want to edit the output of that last segmentation. It did an okay job, but it wasn't great. So I can go in and edit it. Um, so we offer you a lot of ways to sort of, once you've created a segmentation using all of these very large number of settings. Um, you can manipulate. So that's sort of the state of the field. Um, but what we always want to know as we're working on this is, OK, this works. People use this tool, and they use it a lot. How can we push it further? Are there ways we can do a better job of finding objects? Because I showed you that there's a lot of different tunable parameters you need to understand in order to do segmentation and do image and if you're a biologist and you're studying your biology and you don't really care about image analysis, you just want to answer a question, why should you need to go and learn and understand all of those things? If you want to go learn and understand all of those things, I absolutely recommend it because that was my career path. But you might not want to. That might not be as interesting to you as it is to me. So what if we could just understand what a nucleus is or what any biological object is? Um, if you're not somebody who's used to looking at bioimages, you might not know this, but I can tell you that these small white dots, these small purple dots, these really tiny purple dots, these large bright circles, and these small black circles are all nuclei from different kinds of biological images taken in different ways or stained with different things. Um, you didn't know that perhaps before I just told you, but now that I've told you it, you could probably look at a range of images and recognize nuclei in any of these sort of categories of image. So why can't software do that? Why can't a software just figure out what the sort of platonic idea of a nucleus is and just find it <laughs> and save us all a lot of time? Um, and so our group um, co-sponsored along with some sponsors who provided uh, cash and prizes, uh, a, what's 
called the Data Science Bowl on Kaggle in 2018. They do one of these every year. Uh, 2018, we sponsored one for people to just figure out what a nucleus is by training a deep learning network. And I'm going to talk more about how deep learning works a little bit later. Um, and so basically, the entire lab stopped what they were doing for about a month, and we hand annotated 28,000 nuclei. It took about a whole person, like month to, for 10 or 12 people. And then 4,000 teams competed to try and come up with the best universal nucleus detector that would work across all of these different kinds of conditions. Um, and so here's our reference um, for those five categories I just showed you. Uh, a different cell profiler pipeline was made for each one. Um, and the test images were run through the cell profiler pipeline for their class. And it does pretty well. It does better than most of the, uh, the competition. But it's pretty highly outperformed by some of the best performing models that won the competition. And um, if you had to train a model to do this from scratch for each of these kinds of things, it might take you, even if you're already a data scientist, 20 hours. Um, and if you had never used subprofiler or if you knew how to use subprofiler pretty well, it would still take you a few hours to make these five sets of image analysis workflows. Um, but if you have the top performing model, running on your computer, you don't need any configuration time. You just feed these in because it's already been trained by somebody else. And you do better even than the cell profiler expert. And so this made us sort of really comfortable that this could work and that it would be possible to train things that would sort of understand a nucleus, even all of these different kinds of contexts. Um, and so this has led to a lot of really uh, interesting work in this field um, by a lot of people, um, not just us, but we're proud to say that that set of 28,000 nuclei that we spent a month making has been used to make a lot of other cool new tools because that data is now all publicly openly available. Um, training a neural network involves sitting down and circling or annotating each one of these individual objects. And so that's why having a set of 28,000 was so great for the community. And so uh, one of the most popular new tools that uses this data set is a tool called Stardust, which is really great for anything that is a star convex polygon, which is most regular shapes. It doesn't work well for sort of very odd shapes, but most things, including circles, are star convex polygons. As well as a tool called CellPose, which did a very cool trick of trying to train not just where are the parts of the cell, but essentially where is the center of the cell to create this sort of flow from inside to outside. You don't need to understand the math, but just understand it does a really good job of finding the center of a cell and then flowing outward in a way that is much harder to do for clumpy objects or works much better for clumpy objects than conventional things. And a new version of their software, CellPose 2, just came out a couple months ago and allows you to what's called fine tune the model that they've taken. So they've taken hundreds of thousands of cells and nuclei. They've trained networks to figure out what is a cell and what is a nucleus, whether you have cells that look like this or cells that look like this. Uh, but because 100,000 is still not anywhere near all of the cells in the world that exist, it allows you to interactively fix the parts of the image that are wrong. And it can then learn from the parts of the image that you've told it are wrong and do a better job on your specific data. So this is a huge advance over what came before because you can have it give you a first guess and then only fix the parts that are wrong. Um, and other labs are working on really cool techniques so that you don't need to, for something where we don't already have tens or hundreds of thousands of annotated things, where you don't need to go through and sit down and draw, for example, every leaf in this image for hundreds or thousands of images. So this is called Spoko. It's from Anna Kreshuk's lab. And it would allow you to, instead of having to uh, draw in every single pixel in this image of every leaf, to maybe just do two or three leaves in this image. And it would learn essentially how to find the rest of them based on the two or three that you started with. So these tools are getting better and easier to use all the time. And the last thing I wanna say just about finding the objects that you care about is 
it's really important to know when to stop. I've talked about, you know, all of these tools getting better and more accurate, but eventually there comes a point of diminishing returns. And that can actually be the hardest part of this job is knowing when to stop and call it a day. Um, and so typically we give people this list of questions to satisfy. And at that point, they ought to move on, which is, do I agree with most of the, of the objects that the computer has found? Um, do I think that there's an approximately equal number of places where it's found a little bit more than I would have drawn in versus a little bit less than I would have drawn in if I drew the whole thing by hand? Do I have about the same number of cases where an object got accidentally chopped in half as opposed to two objects accidentally got glued together? And does this work for both my negative and positive control samples? Um, and I want to emphasize this point a little bit just because it's going to be important for the things that we talk about later. Um, cells don't always look the same or biological objects don't always look the same once we start mutating them or treating them. And that's part of what we want to learn in image analysis is how do these treatments make the cells look different? But it's important to then have positive controls that we think are going to make the cells look super different so that we can make sure that when we say, oh, the numbers here are super different between, you know, my untreated and my treated, that it's not that our algorithm only knows how to find untreated cells, it's that our algorithm knows how to find all kinds of cells. So now what? We found our objects, and that is absolutely the hardest part of doing bioimage analysis, is finding the thing that you care about. Everything from there is pretty straightforward. It's just a question of what, what are the things that you want to do next. And so typically what you want to do is you want to measure something. Again, we're still in the part of the stuff where we're talking about you know the thing that you care about and you want to measure it. But we do recommend that you don't stop there, that you take hundreds or thousands of measurements per cell. And how do you get hundreds or, or thousands? That's, that's a lot. Um, the way you can do this in cell profiler is that we offer a lot of different kinds of measurements that you can take, um, and I'm going to walk through some. But then also each one of these measurement modules makes not just one measurement, but a whole sort of suite of related measurements that you can then go through and pick and choose and find the very best one. We didn't invent most of these metrics. They can be found in a lot of tools. We're just one tool that allows you to sort of extract a lot of them easily. So one thing you might care about in a biological image is the brightness. You might have a particular dye that measures the exact thing you care about, or you might have stuck a fluorescent protein onto a thing that you care about. And so you just want to know the brightness in individual places. And so you can measure not just the average, but the median, the standard deviation, the total, all of these things. And you can identify objects in one color and one channel. So I can identify nuclei with just a nuclear stain that stains all nuclei and then measure just a fluorescent protein or a, a dye that's specific to the phenotype or the sort of behavior of the cell. I can also see where that intensity is because that might be important. So I can, for example, divide my objects into circular bins and I can measure how much of my brightness versus darkness is in each bin. And is it equal in each bin? Is it sort of off to one side or is it sort of even all the way around? can also measure things like the other thing that we'll often typically measure when we want to look at something specific is size. So what is the area, you know, for example, like in a muscle fiber, you want everything to be aligned in the same orientation. Um, and so cell profiler offers you the way to measure these sorts of things. But again, what if we want to go beyond that? What if there are things that we don't know that we don't know? And so this is where taking more measurements and taking weirder measurements, as I'm about to explain, can actually be really helpful. Um, we call this morphological profiling or image-based profiling, which is essentially, what if instead of looking at the one or two things that we know we care about, let's look at everything and just kind of see what's there. Because finding the objects is the hard part. Let's throw on as many measurements as we can, because that's easy. Now, this isn't the way that most biology gets done. Uh, this paper is a few years old now, but I think it probably wouldn't be too, too different today, which is that even papers that call themselves in this field high content um, really only report typically one or two measurements. And a typical microscope camera contains about a million pixels. And so you're taking a million data points and you're condensing it into one or two. 
it feels like it leaves a lot of data on the table. And so a big part of what our, our lab and our sister lab, the Carpenter Singh Lab does, is try and figure out what could we do with the rest of those million pieces of information. And we know that there's information here that human brains, like I said at the beginning, not very good at. Um, so these are cells in different cell cycle phases. Um, even when I give this talk in person with biological experts and I ask them which cell cycle phase is which, they can't tell the difference. I've asked that in a lot of talks and I've never seen a hand go up in terms of somebody wanting to volunteer which is which. Um, but they, these are the cell cycle phases. They're presented in the order that these happen in the cell cycle. But most of them look pretty much the same to me. The last couple, you can see that a cell is starting to divide into two cells, but most of them look pretty much the same. But it turns out a computer can actually tell the difference. So if you, have, if you also include a DNA stain so that you can tell actually what cell cycle phase these are in, but then you only give the computer these bright field pictures or just pictures taken under white light, the computer can actually do a really good job of knowing which cell cycle phase is which. And so this is what's called a confusion matrix. Um, it shows how much confusion there is in terms of making classified classifications. So here it's showing what is the actual phase based on the DNA dye that the computer never saw. And here's what the computer predicted based on bright field alone. Anything that's on the diagonal is right. And you can see most of the sort of signal here is along the diagonal. Most of it's right. And even in the cases where it's wrong, most of the time when it's wrong, it's off by only one box. And these, what we're calling individual cell cycle phases, don't actually sort of entirely switch like move from one to the other. There's a time period when you're switching from G1 phase to S phase or S to G2 phase. And so the fact that it's making mistakes sort of plus or minus one box actually is just as much about the fact that we as humans are drawing, you know, very hard and fast lines where in fact biology is more of a little bit squishy. And this is just a pretty spinny movie that's showing that uh, if we group these in feature space, so basically take all the measurements and make a 3D projection that cells group by their cell cycle phase nicely in feature space. So what if we could use that information that we can't see? There's information there, the computer sees it. We don't though. So can we use it? So at the same time that cell profiler is making those measurements that make sense to human brains that I just mentioned, like intensity or what is the size of something that's at its perimeter, it can also measure things like Zernike polynomials, which please don't ask me to explain the math because I don't even fully understand it myself, but it's essentially how much does a cell look like these individual and then the, the polynomials go out beyond this uh, shapes. So if I tell you that a cell has a particularly high, you know, Zernike 1, 1, that's really not gonna tell you anything about the cell or its behavior or if it's healthy or unhealthy. It's not really gonna give you any information in a way that makes sense to a human brain. But if I just go through and I add up all these Zernike polynomials, which is what was done in one of these really uh, much earlier papers about it, here we have uh, a cell stained with five different kinds of stains. And here are the shapes that we can uh, pull back out from just looking at their Zernike polynomials. They're not perfect representations, you know, this triangle here is sort of a, a vague triangular blob here, but we know way more about the shape than we did by just sort of saying, well, the area or the perimeter. By area or perimeter, we can't really distinguish this cell from this cell because the stain goes sort of all the way out to the edge, but the pattern is clearly quite different. We can also measure really subtle things about texture. Again, often that human brains can't see because cameras can capture more gradations of bright and dark than humans can see. And even in cases where we can see the difference, there are things like the predictability at a 45 degree angle across a certain amount of pixels um, that a computer understands and we can draw a mathematical thing for what that means, but a human brain is never gonna pick up on. And a human brain isn't even really gonna understand when you say, that this texture measurement is different, what that means in terms of cell health or cell behavior. So that's where this idea of morphological or image-based profiling comes in. We're just gonna take as many measurements as we can, hundreds or thousands, and then we're gonna just group all of our cells and we're just gonna see if interesting clusters fall out. That's really the whole idea. It makes some pretty magical uh, things, but it's not actually conceptually all that fancy. 
we just take a ton of measurements and we look at the groups and we see what happens. But there was no, nothing saying that that approach would work. And so this is one of my favorite papers from early in the field um, where they had a bunch of drugs that fall into particular classes where we basically know for these drugs how the drugs work. Um, and we stained the stain with the cells with uh, a nuclear stain or two different cytoskeletal stains. And then we said, okay, can the computer make one of these confusion matrices like I showed you a couple of slides ago and predict which drugs belong to the same class as other drugs or not? Can they, can they sort things into the right groups? Um, and the figure here I'm showing you is 67%, which maybe doesn't sound all that exciting until I tell you that's just with the nucleus. With the nucleus alone, even though some of these things that it's grouping drugs on are not things that happen in the nucleus, it can, with 67% accuracy, group the drugs into their mechanism of action classes, including, again, things like cholesterol that don't happen in the nucleus. When I let it have just the whole cell and three stains, I can get to 94% accuracy. And similar to the other example I gave you, even the mistakes have, tend to be in things where the processes are really linked. So DNA replication, DNA copying, and DNA damage are really closely connected because damage can happen during copying. And so the fact that these are being confused for one another is probably just as much about the fact that these are really linked processes and they're really similar. So people were like, hey, this approach works. Let's see what else we can do with it. So this is a, a paper from the University of Utah that sort of led to the founding of uh, recursion pharmaceuticals, of which uh, my co-PI, or our sister labs PI is a board member of. Um, this is a case where we have a visual phenotype um, caused by a disease, a gene that causes the disease cerebrocavernous malformation. So if you have this disease, you don't have enough of the CCM protein and there's a really strong phenotype in cells and, you know, but the people are in, are very sick. And so what they did is they said, we're going to add this particular, uh, a particular thing that makes this gene go away in cells. And then we're going to add a bunch of drugs to the cells on the right, the cells that are missing CCM. And so we're going to see of all of the drugs when we have, when we lose CCM, but give them a drug, which ones are most like healthy. So that's a drug that maybe can help treat CCM because it makes the cells look like the un like the unknocked down cells. Um, but what they did is they gave the pictures of the knockdown plus drug to human experts and to the computer. And they said, which are the drugs that are the most promising? Which ones look most like healthy? And then in a mouse model of CCM, they gave them the human expert identified drugs and the computer identified drugs. And it turns out the human brains are not picking up on the, the correct pieces of information because the mice do much better when you let the computer pick the drugs than the human brain, which again, is not quantitative and misses a lot of things. Um, so this led uh, the Carpenter Lab and the Schreiber Lab to develop what they call the cell painting assay. We just actually yesterday uh, have a new preprint about a new version of this assay or really an optimization of it. Um, but essentially what it is, is what can we find that's cheap, that works on a standard microscope that most biology labs would have, and that finds as many parts of the cell as it can. Let's stick all of those on the cells at the same time, and then let's just measure the crap out of it and see what happens. Um, see if, what interesting biology we can learn just by adding these dyes that measure the parts of the cell. They're not biology of any particular disease. They're just looking at where the parts of the cell are. And let's take 6,000 measurements and then let's cluster and see what happens. So again, the cell painting assay in theory, because it's not looking for any particular specific biology, might not have really worked for anything. Um, but of course I'm telling you about it, so it does. Um, so this is another one of my favorite papers. So this is overexpressing certain human genes in, hu in human cells and then looking at them with the cell painting assay. And they picked genes from all different kinds of, uh, all different parts of cell biology, things that do very different things. If I zoom in, um, unless you're an expert in the RAF and RAS pathways, um, you might not understand um, that RAF and BRAF are part of the same uh, pathway, but I'm telling you that they are. But you will notice that when we have two copies of the gene overexpressed, 
Um, in terms of the clustering in cell painting space, which sample is the most like which other sample um, that we're getting the two different copies clustering really closely together. That's a good sign. Um, and we're seeing, th so this is a uh, annotation for a protein mutation. And so mutated copies of this BRAF gene and this RAF gene are showing up in the next cluster over. So it knows that they're different but it also knows that they're pretty close. And so what these are actually, what kind of mutation these actually are are what's called constitutively active. So these proteins are only supposed to be on sometimes and these are on all the time. So it knows that the behavior is similar and it can detect that the behavior is similar, but it can also detect that the behavior is not the same. And so Mohamed Roban, who now has his own lab, um, looked through all of the different clusters that came out of that screen. And we found a lot of things that made sense, which is always nice when you have a relatively new assay to show that it can find things that it ought to be able to find. Um, but in at least one case, it found something that didn't really make sense, which is it showed that two gene pathways, um, which are the nf kappa b pathway and the HIPPO pathway, doesn't really matter what they do, but they weren't thought to be involved anywhere near each other, there's no idea that they interacted. But in that profile space, in their measurements, their measurements look really opposite of one another, like very opposite of one another. And so we're a totally computational lab, so we had to go talk to some people and say, hey, can you help us figure out if this is true or not, because there's no literature support for it. What they found when they did it is that um, these second gray bars are a measurement of a reporter assay for hippo activity. So essentially is the hippo pathway working? And then the ones to the right of it are when you overexpress members of the NF kappa B pathway. So what it turns out is that NF kappa B can turn off hippo, which we had not been known before. And we found this out just by looking at a cell painting assay, which doesn't know anything about NF kappa B or HIPAA, hippo. It just says these look really opposite in, prof in measurement space maybe they do opposite things to one another. It turns out that they do. So this says that you can find a lot of exciting biology just from measuring the parts of cells and then asking questions. Um, this even works in disease states. Um, I love this project, um, which is currently being led by Mars Yekigigi in the group, a senior postdoc. These are skin fibroblasts from people with different psychiatric conditions. And we can see in their skin, we're not talking about brain biopsies, we're talking about skin using the cell painting assay, we can actually see some differences between say, somebody who has depression versus bipolar disorder. Um, that's potentially really cool because if there's an underlying biology that we can see in other cells, that would imply that we could do screening for drugs um, in ways that are much less invasive and much less harmful to people. Um, and the last sort of point I wanna make here is just that um, this is one of the measurements that is the, uh, the most differentiating between bipolar and major depression. Can't quite tell you what it is yet, but uh, hopefully the paper will be out soon. And these are the pictures of high scoring cells for that measurement and low scoring cells for that measurement. Now, if you shuffle these up for me, I'm a professional image analyst. This is what I spend my time doing. I could not correctly put these back. The, the human brain has no access to this information, but with a computer, we can potentially find things that are gonna allow us to treat human patients. Um, I finally just wanna talk about ways that we can maybe do this better in terms of what the measurements themselves are. So I talked about texture and all of these things, and some of them make sense to the human brain and some of them don't. Um, and so Juan Caicedo, who was a former postdoc in the Carpenter Lab and now has his own lab, took this a step further and said, what if we used measurements that are based on deep learning? Now, if you've heard the term deep unit learning used a lot, I know you've heard it used once or twice by me and you've never really understood it. Um, here's your sort of 30 second crash course. Um, this is a, a convolutional neural network. And the idea is we're gonna just start with filters and we're gonna connect the filters up in random ways to try and learn something. And so in this case, we're trying to learn the idea of a spiral. And so if I let the computer essentially try changing um, the, the weight of the connection between these two things, essentially how much does this filter contribute to this filter, um, and then see if it gets better or worse. So this is basically a really you know, long and computationally intensive visit to the optometrist's office, better or worse, better or worse. And so if I let this do better or worse a thousand times, 
um, we sort of have the idea of a spiral. It's not a perfect spiral, but it's a spiral. Um, and the weight of these lines, the thickness of these lines, which previously was all the same, some of them are now really thick and some of them are basically not there anymore. So we call these feature layers and weights, but these are just numbers in the same way that the other measurements we talked about, some of which make no sense to the human brain, are just numbers. And so Juan did what sounds like a really kind of stupid experiment, which is he trained a neural network to try and guess which drug a cell is treated with. I say that that's a stupid experiment because we know what drugs cells are treated with in an experiment because we treated them. We, we put the drugs on there, we know what they are. But by training a neural network to see if it could guess, he trained a neural network where these filters and weights are know something about biology or know something about the drugs. We don't understand necessarily what they know, but we know that they know something. And so he can take those numbers, those filters and weights, and in the same assay that I told you before, we got 94% accuracy, he gets 97% accuracy and 700 times faster. And so his lab is putting together a tool called, tool called Deep Learning, or called Deep Profiler to help extract these features. And my group is creating a tool called Piximi, which you can try now at piximi.app to do these sorts of classifications and even eventually segmentations in the browser. I'm not gonna spend much time telling you about it, but I definitely recommend that you try it. And so it can, for example, in a minute and 45 seconds, uh, classify all those digits that were just shown in that video with really high accuracy on your cell phone. So you can just take out your cell phone, you can tell it which things are ones versus twos versus threes, and it will actually take a neural network that learns to know the difference all inside your phone. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of the rest of this in the interest of time, but I do just wanna wrap up with one final experiment, um, which is one that Greg Way, who also is a former postdoc in the Carpenter Lab, who just started his own lab, uh, did to show how valuable this cell painting information can be. So at the Broad, where I work, um, there, was this, there is this thing called the cell health assay, which if you wanted to know if essentially a drug or a mutation or whatever, what it was doing to a cell, uh, they created two sets of dyes, so you could, you know, put it in two different copies on, on a plate and then treat it with these sets of dyes that would tell you things about the cell cycle phases I mentioned earlier, um, if the cell seemed like it was metabolically sick, and a lot of other things. Um, but these dyes are kind of expensive, and, you know, you have to do two plates of experiments to actually figure anything out. So what Greg wanted to know is, could we basically take a third plate, treat it with cell painting, and then see if we could predict what was happening on the first two plates so that we never have to do the cell health assay again. We can just do cell painting, which is easier and cheaper and tells us more about lots of other biology, not just the health of the cell. And so he trained a regression model that would do this. And it doesn't work for every phenotype. You may not be surprised when I tell you that the ones it does best on are things about like, say, cell shape. Um, but it can learn a lot of them. And so you can make it so that with one simple and cheap assay, you can replace a lot of time consuming and more expensive assays um, with getting a whole lot of extra bonus information too. And so we're really excited about these approaches and we're trying to push this further. We have uh, the world's largest cell painting uh, public data set is going to come out November 1st um, and you can check it out um, on our website. Hopefully what you're thinking at this point is, wow, this was such a cool talk. How can I learn how to do this and where can I go for help? Um, and the answer to that question is forum.image.sc. Um, this is where I think we're up to 40 something um, free open source image analysis software tools all have one common help forum. So that you can, in addition to, you know, finding things like conferences or job opportunities, you can also just post a picture and say, I'm new to this, this is my picture. And this is what I want to know, help, somebody help me. And you have experts from 40 different tools. And because they're all open source free tools, we're pretty good about saying, oh, well, my tool's bad at that, but you should go talk to Pete because his tool, QPath, is so much better at that. He's going to do a great job for you. And you can get help from experts from all around the world in a lot of different ways. Uh, the way we pay to do that is for something called the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, which my group is a part of. It involves, it's an NIH-funded center, which lets us uh, make new tools like the Pixemi tool that I showed really quickly, as well as do community engagement, teach people about these things and help them do it better. 
Um, we do that in the context of driving biological projects, aka biologists who have images and a question and can't get it done. So if you are one of those people, we have NIH money that we can use to help you. So please reach out, <laughs> um, which is a good way to segue to the funders who funded this work, um, all the people who actually did the hard work uh, between my lab and the Carpenter Singh lab, um, and you all for your attention. There we go. Sorry, I had my microphone turned down. That that was in fact a very cool talk. Um, that's this is super cool. <laughs> I, might, I think I think I'll be able to use some of the the, the imaging software for uh, some material science stuff. Um, yeah, please. So let's go ahead. We'll jump into the questions real quick. Uh, so the first one here is uh, how long does it take to run through a large batch of images? So like you mentioned the mm -hmm. the three million uh, images. How how long would something like that actually take? Yeah, so it really depends how like how big your images is and how much stuff you want to find in them, but mm -hmm. we're working to make it faster all the time. So for the sort of 5,000, 6,000 feature self-painting assay that I mentioned, mm -hmm. for each image um, in Cell Profiler 3, it took about an hour. In Cell Profiler 4, it takes about five minutes. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, if five minutes times three million is an awful lot faster, but once you get above, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of images, mm -hmm. you probably want to be running on a cluster in the cloud and Cell Profiler works in those places. We have tools to help you do it. Um, you can just sort of start it up in a Docker container wherever you want. Um, but yeah, beyond a few thousand, get it, running it on your laptop gets a little dicey. That's that's fair. That, that's that's <laughs> very cool. I mean, the, the versatility is, is incredible. Uh, that's That's really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Does the does the software work with other microscope images? The example given is um, rock in sections. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say to try and open any of these images is ImageJ, just because in general people who use any kind of microscope use ImageJ, mm -hmm. and we and ImageJ use the same underlying library, which is called Bioformats, to open images. So if they can open it, we can open it, and we can open Bioformats opens just about everything. So okay. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Could uh, something, what you know, cell profiler or another piece of software that you guys have made be used to look for things like um, diffraction spacing to identify crystallinity or phases in TEM images? Yeah. Um, it, in general, um, it can. With the with things like that, um, it's just going to be essentially. So cell profiler needs to get into that. You know, thing I like is bright. Everything else is dark space. Mm -hmm. So if it's not easy to get into that space, there's actually a really great tool called Elastic, um, which is made from Anna Kreshek's lab, who I mentioned earlier. And that's a great way to sort of train um, a pixel classifier where you can teach it which parts of the image are crystal and not crystal. And then you could pop over to cell profiler and take your measurements there. So that's a workflow we actually have some tutorials online for about how to start in Elastic and then go to cell profiler. Um, but if it's non-fluorescent, cell profiler will often have a harder part time getting started. Okay, all right, that's fair. Uh, so our last question here is uh, what, what pitfalls generally should users of these software be aware of? That's a really good question. Um, one one thing I will say is um, uh, I mentioned sort of the need for positive controls and things like that. Um, look at your pictures. Um, it's you don't actually have to. You know, you can take measurements of cells and never actually look at a single picture. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't tell you how many hours I personally and I know a lot of other people have lost sort of chasing down what seemed like a really cool numerical result that was actually just we didn't find the object correctly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like. Um, because, and it can be really easy to get excited, especially if it's in the direction of a change that you expected and, you know, you go start hunting it and then it turns out you didn't find the object right. That's why I say that's the really hard part because it is. And new, new, uh, the new deep learning based tools, I think are going to make it a lot, lot easier and they're going to make it so you don't need to understand, you know, 30 tunable parameters in order to find the thing you care about and measure it and then go on with your day. Um, but that's the biggest pitfall. That's that is a pretty big one, but that that's good to know that that you know even even that is something that's being worked on mm -hmm. and may may not yeah. be as big of an issue going forward. That's fantastic. But yeah, but cell profiler has a thing where you can overlay the outlines of the things that you found, and you can save that out as a picture and do it. Like even if you have thousands of images, do it, and then you know save them all in one folder, and then quick on you know your computers like 
uh, just sort of onboard picture editor, look through them real fast and sort of say, does it seem like most of these are right? Um, because a, yeah. you can you can save yourself a lot of, of time and heartache, I can tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for a great talk. Um, let me get you to hang around for just one second. We'll talk briefly. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to everybody for the questions. Um, we'll be back in about five or so minutes with our next talk. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely.